The names of Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Aileen Warnos, The Zodiac, and Richard Ramirez will always come to mind whenever the subject of serial killers is mentioned. Despite their sinister and twisted crimes, they have become household names and continue to instill fear in people's minds even today. Yet, there are serial killers whose crimes are equally as chilling but these stories are rarely told. These terrifying serial killers you might not have heard of but you will never forget. 1. Kelly Cochran Kelly Marie Cochran, 34, stands accused of helping her husband kill and dismember her boyfriend. She is also charged with killing her husband to even the score, and the prosecuting attorney thinks her body count may not stop there. According to reports, on October 13, 2014, Cochran and her husband, 37-year-old Jason Cochran, came up with a diabolical plan. The next night, Cochran would lure 53-year-old Christopher Reagan, Kelly's co-worker and boyfriend, to her home with the promise of sex and Jason would kill him. The plan worked, and when Jason caught Reagan with his wife, he shot him in the head with a .22 caliber long barrel shotgun. The Cochrans then set about dismembering Reagan's body. Kelly later admitted to getting a cord for an electric handsaw, known colloquially as a sawzall, so Jason Cochran could cut up his corpse. They then divided Reagan's body between garbage bags and threw the bags into the woods around the Iron River in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Reagan was reported missing a few days later and his car was found abandoned at a park and ride lot four miles east of Iron River, Michigan. According to the local Daily News, police honed in on Cochran because she was one of the last people to see Rakin. When police searched her home with the FBI in March 2015, they found nothing, but Cochran was spooked and she and her husband packed up and moved to Lake County, Indiana. Police continued their investigation with Kelly listed a person of interest, but a year passed and still they had nothing. Then, in February 2016, Jason died of an apparent heroin overdose. Kelly held a memorial service, writing on Facebook that his death was the hardest thing I will ever have to deal with. But police weren't buying it. Nine weeks after Jason died, Michigan authorities charged Kelly Cochran with Reagan's death, and she fled Indiana. The U.S. Marshals Service eventually tracked her down in Kentucky, where she was arrested on April 28 and taken into custody. According to court documents, she spent her time in her jail cell turning her glasses into shanks and threatening violence against anyone who came near her. She was extradited to Michigan where she is now in custody awaiting trial. Following her arrest, Cochran was interrogated by both Michigan and Indiana police for almost 70 hours. According to the Northwest Indiana Post-Tribune, she was able to direct investigators to a desolate stretch of Michigan woods where they discovered evidence of Cochran's alleged crimes, including a human skull with an apparent bullet hull, bones and bone fragments. Police also recovered a .22 caliber rifle, a .22 caliber bullet, and a pair of glasses at the scene. While Cochran was in custody, police also questioned her about the death of her husband. They had grown suspicious when Cochran's version of what happened the night that Jason Cochran died kept changing. Paramedics had been called to the house that Cochran shared with her husband in February, but the EMTs found Jason unresponsive and were unable to revive him. At first glance it looked like he had died of a heroin overdose, but the Indiana Lake County coroner discovered that Jason had actually died from asphyxiation, not heroin. That's when suspicion turned to his wife who had been disruptive while EMT were working on her husband's body. The post Tribune reports Cochran told police that she delivered an overdose of heroin to her husband and proceeded to put her hands on his neck, nose, and mouth until he died less than a minute later. In an interview with detectives in Hobart, Indiana, Cochran finally gave police a motive for her brutal crimes, her decade-plus marriage needed saving. According to the post Tribune, Cochran told police that the night before the murder, she and her husband had argued, perhaps about Reagan, and her husband wanted to know how she was going to fix things. The answer they stumbled on, apparently, was to kill Reagan. In interviews, Cochran said she blamed her husband for Reagan's death and for taking the only good thing I had in my life. The post tricky notes that in court records Cochran said, I still hate him, her husband, and yes, it was revenge. I even the score. There was a brief moment before Reagan's death, 
she had reportedly considered killing her husband instead of her boyfriend. Instead, she ended up killing them both, waiting 16 months to exact her revenge on her husband. In Indiana, Cochran has been charged with the death of her husband. In Michigan, she faces charges related to Reagan's death, including homicide, assisting her husband to mutilate, deface, remove or carry away a portion of a dead body and concealing the death of an individual. Cochran pleaded not guilty to all the charges. While she initially claimed that she wanted to defend herself, she eventually relented and asked for assistance from a public defender. While Cochran is charged with two murders, Iron County prosecuting attorney Melissa Powell thinks there may be more bodies buried in Cochran's past. According to her court filings, Cochran has claimed responsibility for the deaths of other individuals, which, if true, make her a serial killer. While it's unclear what other deaths Cochran may be talking about, Powell appears to be taking the statement seriously enough to question Cochran's mental health. Before Powell can launch an investigation into Cochran's claims, she has to prove that Cochran is competent. Iron County District Court Judge C. Joseph Schwedler agreed and has ordered a forensic examination of Cochran to determine both mental competency and criminal responsibility. According to Powell's filings, Cochran has a long history of mental illness, including a voluntary admission to a psychiatric hospital in Indiana and suicidal ideation. Cochran has written her family goodbye letters and has threatened to commit suicide while incarcerated as well as threatened bodily harm against any persons whom she may have contact with while incarcerated. Until the forensic examination can determine her competency, which the judge has asked to expedite, Cochran remains in the Iron County Jail on a $5 million cash bond. 2. Thomas Eugene Thomas Eugene Creech, and he's been on death row in Idaho for over 37 years now for the murder of prison inmate David Dale Jensen on May 13, 1981, but that isn't the only murder Creech is convicted of committing and it isn't the only time Creech was sentenced to death row. He was sentenced to death again in 2019. I do not know why all this delay in the implementation of the penalty. Since that time, I have not obtained confirmed information about whether he was executed, died in prison, or is still imprisoned. If you have confirmed information, tell us in the comments. At the time of the murder of David Dale Jensen in 1981, Jensen and Creech were both inmates housed inside the maximum security prison at Idaho's penitentiary. Creech was serving time for two murder convictions in Idaho. He was convinced to attack and did in fact murder David Jensen, a 22 or 23-year-old young man who was in prison as a car thief, said Jim Harris, former Ada County prosecutor who asked for the death penalty against Creech in 1982. According to court documents, Jensen was partially disabled. Years earlier, in an attempted suicide, he shot himself in the head, resulting in the removal of part of his brain and a plastic plate being placed in his skull, causing impaired speech and motor functions. Court documents say he and Thomas Creech were not on good terms. Creech was a janitor at the penitentiary at the time, and court documents say Creech and Jensen had argued about Jensen dirtying the floor, something Creech had to clean up. Because of his janitorial duties, Thomas Creech was the only prisoner who could be out of his cell at the same time as another inmate. Both Chuck Palmer and I wrote letters to the penitentiary warden during that time frame, once he was released, warning the warden in the penitentiary system that this was a very dangerous criminal, said Harris. Chuck Palmer was the Ada County Sheriff at the time. He and Jim Harris, Ada County prosecuting attorney in 1981, both believed that if Creech were given the opportunity to kill, even while in prison, he would act on it. That's what happened on May 13th of 1981. David Dale Jensen was released from his cell for an hour to exercise and shower. Jensen had other plans during that time though. Court documents say David Dale Jensen attacked Thomas Creech with a sock filled with batteries. Creech was able to take the weapon away from Jensen, and it was that same weapon Creech would later use to beat Jensen to death. In an exclusive letter to us from Creech he admits to that, again, yes, I killed that guy. But he attacked me, wrote Creech. Creech went on to claim self-defense in the incident, but prosecution argued he went above and beyond self-defense. Following that murder in 1981, 
Creech was handed the death penalty sentence in 1983 for the second time in his life. You see, that wasn't his first murder. His criminal history started at the age of 16, said Harris. Former Ada County Prosecutor Jim Harris said Creech spoke to him about his childhood. I think it was potentially the loss of his father at a very young age. Particularly since the man essentially died in his arms. His first enemy. His first attempted murder was the male nurse that failed to get help to his father before he died, said Harris. The Journal News out of Hamilton, Ohio wrote that Creech claimed he committed his first murder at the age of 17 by drowning a friend in New Miami who he believed was responsible for the traffic death of his girlfriend. The paper also stated Creech claimed to have killed five people from a motorcycle gang in Ohio for satanic cult worship rituals. In a United Press International article from 1986, writer Steve Crean reported that Creech ran away from home and claims to have killed a man in San Francisco in 1965. During that time in San Francisco, sources say Thomas Creech became involved with the Church of Satan before it was officially organized in 1969. In 1973 Creech married Thomasine Loren White. That same year, both of them were wanted in connection of the murder of Paul C. Schrader in Tucson, Arizona. The Tucson Daily Citizen paper reported on January 4, 1974 that Paul C. Schrader was stabbed to death at the downtown Moore Hotel in Tucson, Arizona. Creech was arrested for the murder in Beaver, Utah and taken back to Arizona to face charges, but after hours of deliberation, 23-year-old Creech was acquitted of the Tucson murder. In 1974, Creech and his wife, Thomasine, moved to Portland. A United Press International article stated that Thomas Creech spent some time in the Oregon Psychiatric Hospital in Salem. After he was released, he moved into the Street Marks Episcopal Church in Portland and began work as their resident maintenance worker. In the exclusive letter Creech sent to us, he said his wife Thomasine was raped by 11 men and tossed out a window four stories high that left her paralyzed and damaged mentally, wrote Creech. She later died by suicide in the Oregon State Hospital. His letter to us also stated that he killed some of the men who allegedly raped his wife. Also in 1974, Creech was convicted of killing 22-year-old William Joseph Dean. An article from the United Press International stated that Dean's body was found in Creech's living quarters inside the St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Portland. And later that same year, two traveling painters were found shot to death in Idaho. Authorities say Thomas Creech and his girlfriend Carol Spaulding were hitchhiking from Lewiston to Donnelly, Idaho when two men by the name of Edward T. Arnold and John Wayne Bradford picked them up in their 1956 Buick. Thomas shot John and Edward then partially buried their bodies off Highway 55 in Donnelly. The judge in the case, J. Ray Dertsky, said Creech denied killing the two in Idaho in court, but admitted to being a mass murderer. Judge Dertsky recorded his recollection of Creech's original 1975 trial in an audio recording for the Idaho Historical Society before his passing. It was verified that they did find some of the bodies that he identified before them and showed them where they was. That was his defense in my case. He says my goodness I'm admitting I killed all these other people. I wouldn't deny this if I had done it, said Judge Dertsky. A statement from the Idaho Supreme Court noted, Creech has admitted to killing or participating in the killing of at least 26 people. The bodies of 11 of his victims who were shot, stabbed, beaten, or strangled to death have been recovered in seven states. And former Ada County Prosecutor Jim Harris said, they found a large number of skeletons that Tom lead them to in a mine shaft in California. Judge J. Ray Dertsky also made this statement inside the courthouse in Wallace, Idaho. Law enforcement officers were worried about him in the trial. Worried about security because of all the rumors getting around that he had been a member of the Hells Angels and they were going to come up her and break him out. And I moved him up to Wallace to try him where there had not been any publicity. Judge Dertsky found Creech guilty of the Donnelly murders and sentenced him to hang in March of 1976. At that time, Idaho's law stated a first-degree murder charge was a mandatory death sentence. That law was later ruled unconstitutional by the Idaho Supreme Court in 1979, and Creech was sentenced to life in prison. 
that didn't sit well with Sheriff Palmer or Prosecutor Jim Harris. In our opinion Creech was a psychotic and he didn't like inmates and he would probably kill someone if they didn't supervise him very closely around other inmates. It was a short time after that Creech was allowed trustee status and given full run of several sections of maximum security as a janitor, said Harris. That statement was almost a foreshadow of what was to come a mere two years later when Thomas Creech killed again. The prosecution quoted the statement made by Creech in court, and okay. I kicked him a couple more times and he was laying there bleeding real bad and breathing real funny. By 1982 Thomas Creech was convicted for the murder of David Dale Jensen and he was back on death row. Then, just a few years later Creech filed a writ of habeas corpus. And in the midst of appeals, former Ada County Deputy Prosecutor Roger Bourne made this statement in court in 1995, if the death penalty doesn't fit this defendant. Who does it fit? This defendant is a mass murderer. He has shown extreme violence while in the penitentiary. If the legislature didn't intend it to fit this defendant, who could it fit any better? This is where today's stories end. Tell us what you think in the comments. And do not forget to subscribe to the channel and activate the alert bell to receive all new videos. Thank you for watching. I wish you a happy life with everyone around you.